Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Museum of Texas Tech University. I'm Gary Morgan. I'm the executive director of the museum, and I'm delighted to have you here tonight, and I'm delighted that we're able to host this event. Uh, this, this talk is part of the seminar series <clears throat> for the Creative Process Commons here at Texas Tech and that commons and the series are supported by the Office of the Provost, uh, the Office of the Senior Vice President of Research, uh, STEM Corps here at Texas Tech and the museum. We really have an interesting speaker here tonight um, and I'm delighted that Margaret Wertheim has been able to come to Texas Tech for the several days that she has been here. Uh, just a couple of words on the format for the evening. Uh, we will have Margaret speaking, of course, and then there will be a small panel discussion. Uh, a few people will come up who bring various perspectives on, <clears throat> on Margaret's work, and that will also be a time for Q&A. So be thinking about your questions, uh, and I'm sure you'll have, have plenty because I know from the, the diversity of points that Margaret covers that there'll be all sorts of places that you can plug in. So that will be the opportunity for Q&A. We'll run through to about 7.30ish, uh, and then hang on with us, we've got some snacks out in the sculpture court through till about 8.30. Um, and I would also mention that we have uh, a nice display of um, crochet, from the museum collections, which has been put together by our curator uh, of uh, clothing and textiles, Marion Ann Montgomery, and that's through the museum and down in the main gallery. If you have a chance, wander down and have a little bit of a look at that. It's not a crocheted coral reef, folks, but it does show you some of the, the skills of crochet. Um, Margaret's coverage and the kind of topics she 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 touches upon are a real interest to me for a variety of reasons. One is that I'm a marine biologist and so naturally here I am in Lubbock, West Texas. I won't go into that story. Uh, I'm also an Australian marine biologist so I, I share some, some heritage with, with Margaret. Uh, so I know some of Margaret's biological case studies pretty well. I know nudibranchs which are you know, the shellless snails, beautiful when you see them in the wild. They're all these gorgeous, gorgeous colours. And of course, I know corals very well. I, I collected a lot on coral reefs all over the world. Uh, but I never saw nudibranchs or corals primarily as manifestations of mathematics. Uh, sure, I mean, when you look at corals, if you look at the hard corals, they're scientifically called the hexacoralia and the soft corals are the octocoralia hex for six oct for eight and that relates to the the number of radiations in there in the polyps so there's there's some element of mathematics in the nomenclature but beyond that i just saw them as as biological entities in fact when i've thought of maths I've, oh, excuse me, Australians often call it maths. We have the S on the end there, so excuse me if I slip in there. Math, when we think of math. I often think of it as being formulae which are created by mathematicians. And I often think of that movie, A Beautiful Mind, about the economist John Nash. You remember that one? Um, that had Russell Crowe in it, you remember, who is kind of Australian, but he's actually New Zealand when he's throwing phones and things like that. But again, that's another story. And, and in that, at one point, he stands up in front of a window and he writes all these formulae all over the window. And that was kind of the way I'd often seen mathematics and mathematicians, something that, that mathematicians would create and put out there. And what Margaret reminds us of is that mathematics is something that we can discover, that it's something that's around us. And in that I'm, I'm reminded of a quote that's attributed to the artist Michelangelo, who said that sculpture is already complete within the marble block. Before I start my work, it is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. And I think that notion of revealing math in the world around us is a little more comforting than the notion of mathematics being something that just elite mathematicians create. 
it seems to me to make math more relevant. And it's somehow a little less scary than the mathematician writing maths on the whiteboard. And just as an aside, given the timing of this talk, um, March 14 was just last week. And March 14 is Pi Day. And Pi Day is the day each year that marks the celebration of maths via the discovery of the value of pi that, of course, relates the circle's circumference to its radius. And this year, March 14, saw the loss of Stephen Hawking, who is certainly one of the greatest mathematicians and physicists of the last 50 years. March 14 just also happens to be the birthday of Albert Einstein. Things to ponder on, I think. Enough of that. To our speaker. Margaret Wertheim has been a world leader in engaging people with STEM and in particular connecting women and girls with maths. Her work on science and gender reveals some of the ob obstacles that women face to having full participation in STEM fields. And she also celebrates the science and maths domains which all of us can have access to. Wertheim's interest in gender and science led her to write her groundbreaking book, Pythagoras Trousers, a history of the relationship between physics and religion that also explores the barriers between women and math. She has written two other books, The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace and Physics on the Fringe. She's written about science and technology for several women's magazines, including Vogue Australia and Australian L. She wrote a six-part television science series aimed at teenage girls for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. That was called Catalyst, and it's recognised as a landmark series. More recently, Margaret's uh, contributed to the New York Times and Los Angeles Times, and is a contributing editor to, to Cabinet Magazine, the International Arts and Culture Quarterly. From 2001 to 2005, she wrote the Quark Soup science column for LA Weekly. And in 2006, her writing was awarded the Print Journalism Prize from the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Her hyperbolic crochet coral reef project, which she created with her twin sister, Christine, is now the largest participatory art and science endeavor in the world. It brings together a unique mix of mathematics, environmental science, community practice, and feminism. Around 10,000 women in a dozen countries have participated in this project by now. And it has had exhibitions which have featured around the world, been seen by nearly two million people in places like uh, the Smithsonian uh, here in Washington. Participants have included mathematicians, fisherwomen, crafters, women in shelters, prisoners, people from all sorts of backgrounds. And I might add, several years ago, when I was working for another museum, I had hopes of getting uh, that exhibit or some part of it. For various reasons, it didn't happen, but I've never lost my interest in what it represents. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Margaret Wertheim. coming tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here in Texas Tech. Um, I didn't realize I was being introduced by a fellow Aussie, which is excellent. One doesn't hear Australian accents much where I live in LA, so it's lovely to see you here, here in Lubbock, Texas. So um, my talk tonight is on the subject of how to play mathematics. And um, this is a subject that has been close to my heart for a very long time. I have been, as uh, Barry's beautiful introduction uh, told you more than you probably need to know about me, I have been um, writing and communicating about science for 30 years. But about um, 15 years ago, I decided that we needed more creative and innovative ways for, to communicate about science and math and technology. And that I wanted to do something that would not only just give people access to these things by reading, but would actually give them access to it by doing. 
So I started this little organization called the Institute for Figuring, which is based in Los Angeles. And um, you'll notice that the acronym of the organization, IFF, is actually the logical symbol for if and only if. Um, and the mission of the Institute for Figuring is to engage people with the poetic and aesthetic dimensions of science and mathematics. So, you know, I spent six years at university studying physics and maths, thinking I would be a research physicist. And the reason that I studied these things was simply because I thought they were incredibly beautiful. And I still do. I still think math is, you know, the great um, Edna St. Vincent Millay poem, Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare. It's, it, there is a lot to be said for that. Pure mathematics is pure beauty. But, um, so I hope to show you today some of the absolutely stunning beauty of mathematics, but the focus of my talk really is going to be on a much more radical claim than that math is beautiful because any mathematician feels that math is beautiful. Um, but my radical claim is the following. We are used to engaging with mathematics, and here we have um, a diagram of a famous mathematical object called the logarithmic spiral. And here's a very you know, precise mathematical representation of that. But we um, are used to thinking about mathematics as something that is pure, that is a symbolic thing, that it is engaged with you know, through symbols, equations, formula, etc. sometimes you know, diagrams like this. And it's something that you engage with um, through textbooks and learning, looking at books. That's how I learned it at university, and it's an absolutely wonderful thing. Um, and so here's the kind of way that mathematicians you know, f can describe that spiral we've just looked at using some equations. Don't bother to you know, try to comprehend them. My point is just to simply show you that you know, when you learn maths standardly, this is what you do. You, know, you just kind of go for the formulae. But my claim, and what my talk is about today, is that Mathematics, the pro that a way of engaging with mathematics is through embodied things. And what I in fact want to make the claim is that a lot of embodied things actually do mathematics. So we're used to thinking of doing mathematics as something that is only done when you actually write down equations and formally solve them you know, by writing it down. But what I want to propose to you today is that there are lots of things in the world, and ultimately things that we call people, who do mathematics all the time. That they actually play mathematics, they perform mathematics, they don't even necessarily have brains, so they can't symbolize mathematics, they can't make, they can't make abstract symbolic representations of it, but they literally do it. And I'm going to propose to you at the end of this that this is not just a sort of epistemological argument, that it is an argument that I believe has really important political power for how we as humans engage with mathematics in general in our society and particularly when we come to teaching it. So here we have a Nautilus shell, which I'm sure you've all seen a billion times. And as we see, that blue line shows that it maps out a very close to perfect logarithmic spiral, which we were just looking at as a mathematical diagram. Now, of course, there is nothing in nature that's absolutely mathematically perfect. You know, there's lots of things in nature, you know, for instance, there's spheres in nature, there's no such thing as an absolutely mathematically perfect sphere. But this is an extremely good approximation of a logarithmic spiral. The shell made by a brainless, or a, an organism with a very, very, very small brain, has literally built, it has performed in the body of its being, a spiral. Here is a hurricane seen from outer space. Again, very close to a perfect logarithmic spiral. And a spiral galaxy, again, very, very close not exactly, but very close to a mathematical, the, the object we study formally in mathematics. So what I want to ask here is the question, do we think it's possible that these things, these galaxies, 
these clouds, these shells, are they doing mathematics? I would like to say that they are. They aren't writing the equations. They couldn't be asked to sit a test, but they are actually enacting the mathematics. Now, here's an object that's enacting mathematics and is enacting the mathematics of spirals in a beautiful way. It's a very big kind of broccoli, it's a particularly Italian kind of broccoli. And the spirals, sorry, the, the, the florets on heads of broccoli are actually going around in spirals. And a lot of plants actually do this. Um, they, they map out an approximation, a very good approximation of a logarithmic spiral by what's called the phylotactic angle, which is the, the little stalks, the, the little bits that come off the main stem, actually go around in a, in a very particular angle at each step. And, that, and because that angle actually, as you go around, keep blocking out that through that particular angle each time, you ultimately create a spiral. So is the broccoli, as it were, doing math? Well, perhaps, and I, I would like to say perhaps yes. Now, moving up, as it were, the food channel, I don't want to sort of really you know, talk about evolution in, in an upward sense, but here's a creature that we recognize actually does definitively have a brain. It's called a, pe a peregrine falcon. And when peregrine falcons dive towards their prey, they dive in the shape of a logarithmic spiral, and they do it in a very beautiful way. So you can see that falcon has got its head cocked. It's got its head cocked at a very particular angle. And what that means is that as the falcon dies, it keeps its head at that angle, and by following the logarithmic spiral, it's capable, because it keeps its head at that angle and it dives in a spiral, it always keeps its vision dead focused on its prey which means one, that's one of the reasons why these are such lethal killing machines. Because, as it were, their, their embodiment has figured out a way to, as it were, get at that thing down there with absolute, almost perfect efficiency. So, broccolis do spirals, galaxies do spirals, tornadoes do spirals, and birds do spirals. Interesting. Now I'd like to move to a different kind of mathematical structure. The mathematics of crystals, or what in a mathematic, to a mathematician, is more widely referred to as tessellation patterns. So you all recognize this, it's a cube. And cubes are realized in lots of natural structures, particularly crystals. And the most common crystal that we all encounter, where we encounter little cubes, is salt. So salt that we eat, you know, every day, um, is arranged as a series of little cubes filling the space. And there are other minerals that are cubic, and where they realize the structure of the atoms is arranged so that they fill space with a beautiful cubic lattice. Salt is one of them, and um, there's another one, which is a very rare kind of um, uh, ruby, and it's called uh, demitoid. And that's the green one, so the sorry, it's a very rare form of garnet, and it's these beautiful, perfect green crystals. Now, it's easy to think of filling space with cubes, because you know we all sort of see cubes all the time, and they're kind of reflected in things like our buildings, like, you know, there are lots of almost cubic rooms. So a question arises, how many different ways could you fill space with exact, you know, a cube is, is a shape that all, it's what's called a platonic solid, all of the faces are the same, so it's a perfectly regular solid. So a question arises, how, you know, are there many ways that we can fill space, three-dimensional space, using perfectly regular solids? And the fact is there aren't actually very many ways because three-dimensional space is actually quite difficult to fill with perfect solids. But there is another um, platonic solid that you can fill space with, and that's the rhombic dodecahedron, which is basically a 12-sided object, which has um, each shape of it is uh, a diamond, a rhombus. And you know that's a fairly exotic structure. And then you say, OK, well, that's a nice thing that mathematicians have discovered that you can fill space with that way. 
is there anything in nature that does that? And yes, it turns out that there is. There is a mineral, sorry, there is a mineral called androcyte that actually does this. It, it fills the space with these perfect little rhombic dodecahedrons, which is really lovely. Now, for mathematicians, this whole study of filling space with um, regular repeating units is a very, very big subject in mathematics. And you can think about it in three dimensions, you know, how many ways can we fill this room, for instance, um, and mathematicians have done that. But the most famous um, way in which mathematicians have studied um, filling space is actually in two dimensions. So, you know, as it were, a crystal fills three dimensions. If you do it in two dimensions, you can think of it as being like a crystal in 2D. Um, which from a mathematical point of view it technically is. Now, mathematicians have been studying, Western mathematicians have been studying this way of filling space um, in two dimensions for about 500 years. And the place where you will all encounter this in your life re very regularly is on a bathroom floor. You know, you see hexagons on a bathroom floor and the hexagons fill the space completely. So there's a whole mathematical branch of mathematics devoted to saying how many ways can I fill space with regular repeating units. And, you know, modern Western mathematicians, in fact, didn't invent the study of this. Here we have, you know, an ancient Roman tiling pattern that dates back about 2,000 years. And the Romans had, you know, the, the Romans were good mosaicists and, and they, they explored some of this. Again, they, they didn't write it down, but they did um, actually, you know, formally have, as it were, a practically applied mathematics of doing these tiling patterns. But the people who really perfected this were Islamic mosaicists from about the 10th century on. And the Islamic mosaicists, um, you know, you've all seen pictures, I'm sure, of, of some Islamic tiling patterns. Islamic mosaicists, it turns out, were extremely brilliant mathematicians. Again, they didn't work with formula the way we did. But they actually discovered an enormous amount of mathematics which they wrote down in their own ways, not the way that modern mathematicians do with, with equations. But they actually, in their tilings, they actually discovered something that took Western mathematicians about another 800 years to discover, which is that there actually are only 17 different in independently unique regular forms of tiling that you can work. If you want to fill a plane, you know, fill a floor, there's actually only 17 different patterns that you can do it where you use, you know, a single repeating unit. And it took Western mathematicians actually quite a long time to figure out that, that the Islamic mosaicists of the Middle Ages had actually done all of that work and figured it all out way back in the Middle Ages, long before we in the West did it, the Europeans did it, you know, like in the 19th century. So, you know, I'm just showing you some of the absolutely marvelous tiling patterns that the Islamic people developed. But what I want to make the point here is that without, as it were, formalizing it with the kinds of equations that we use, they had played it out through physically embodied systems of putting little tiles here and here and here, they had literally figured out the mathematical structures that are inherent in tessellations of the plane, which is what the formal mathematics work tell the tiling is. So they figured out a long time ago, there's only 17 regular ways of tiling. That means if I use exactly the same unit, there's only 17 independently different units that will fill the plane with no gaps. And that was believed to be so in Western mathematics. It was believed for a long time that there was no possibilities of regularly filling a plane except these 17 things. And then in about the, the late 1960s, a couple of famous mathematicians discovered a brand new kind of tiling pattern. It's called Penrose tiling patterns, or aperiodic tiling patterns for the more generic name. And what I'm showing you a picture of it here, this is you know, generated by um, a, ma a mathematician. 
And what is unique about this tiling pattern is that it's not what it's not completely regular. It looks sort of regular, doesn't it? There's a lot of shapes that keep repeating. But it's not absolutely regular like a salt crystal. What it is, it does something extraordinary. If you look at this form for a while, you can see that it has there, as it were, five axes going through it. Can you all see that? Can you sort of make out that there are five, you can sort of make out like five big lines going through the middle. So this, this type pattern has what's called five-fold symmetry. Now, Western mathematicians thought they convinced themselves a long time ago that this was physically, that this was mathematically impossible. They believed from about the 17th century on, Western mathematicians believed that they had proved that no such thing could exist. However, in the, as I said, in the late 1960s, this great physicist Roger Penrose and several other people independently discovered this, this new kind of tiling pattern that does have five-fold symmetry. And what's special about it is that it's not perfectly repeating, it's almost repeating. But the uh, and one way of looking at this is a beautiful thing. It's actually a mathematical representation of what in, math, in science is technically called chaos. So it's a mathematical representation of chaos. And here's another version of it that might make it easy for you to see the five-fold symmetry of it. Can, can you can you all sort of see that there is five-foldness in this? You will if you if you stare at it long enough, but. Anyway, so in the 1960s, mathematicians realized, oh my gosh, we thought we'd prove that these things couldn't exist, and actually we've just discovered that they do exist. And they thought, oh, well, that's a real mathematical oddity, so mathematicians who study these things went off and played with them and found more different examples of this. But they absolutely were certain that nothing like this would exist in nature. It couldn't possibly happen, it was so bizarre, nothing in nature could possibly do this. And then in the 1990s, an Israeli chemist named Danny Schechter announced that using aluminium, palladium, and um, manganese, that he had created a um, crystal with five-fold symmetry in it. And this is um, an, uh, some sort of X-ray diffraction pattern of that actual crystal. So Danny Schechter announced the world in, 19, I think it's 1994, world, I've actually made this crystal. And the reaction of the science world was to say, rubbish, it's not possible. There were so many people convinced that this was physically impossible that they refused to believe him. A few years ago, he was granted the Nobel Prize for this, science, for this discovery because it turned out he really had done it. And after he made, he, he developed this using exotic materials in a laboratory. And after it, after he'd done that, and scientists finally came to accept that he, it really, he really had done it, a quest began where people asked themselves, is it possible that anything in the natural world could do this? You know, is there, is there a crystal that could really do this just in nature, you know, not in some high-tech lab, but in nature? And most people thought it was pretty unlikely but there was one guy, Paul Steinhardt, who was pretty certain, he, he, he'd independently discovered the quasi crystal, the, the aperiodic tilings. He was pretty convinced that nature should have, as it were, figured it out. And lo and behold, he, he searched and searched, and they finally found a mineral that did this, that exists in the real world, and they named it icosahedrite. So here is a piece of a supposedly impossible mineral. And what I love about this is that, again, we have a thing that, you know, first of all, mathematicians says it couldn't exist logically. Then they said it couldn't exist physically. Then they said it couldn't exist naturally. And here it is. So is the crystal thinking? Is it figuring? I mean, in some sense, the crystal has figured out this bizarre thing that some of the finest mathematicians in, in our culture thought was impossible. So in some sense, I want to claim that the mineral knows mathematics. Now, the final example that I want to get us to think about, and this will lead us into the human dimension, is hyperbolic geometry. 
So if we look at corals, at, and that's, sorry, that's actually sponge, but here's a bunch of corals. These structures are high, they, conf they are what is called hyperbolic geometric structures. And hyperbolic geometry is an alternative to the Euclidean geometry we learn about at school, you all studied at school, and I'm going to go into a little bit in a minute what this is. But first of all, what I want to show you is that hyperbolic structures are widely realized in the natural world, in sponges and corals and nudibranchs. Here's some lovely nudibranchs who are hyperbolic creatures in their frills. And what's lovely about this is that, again, mathematicians spend hundreds of years trying to prove that hyperbolic structures were impossible. And meanwhile, brainless corals and nudibranchs had been doing it for 400 million years. And the reason mathematics mathematicians thought that hyperbolic structures were impossible was because they violated one of the axioms of Euclid's geometry. And because mathematicians were so convinced that everything that Euclid said must be right, they couldn't believe that something that violated one of Euclid's axioms could be true. But here's something that's never heard of Euclid's axioms, let's sleep. And they're doing hyperbolic geometry and just getting on with it. And cactuses are doing it. And they never heard of Euclid's axioms, so they didn't know it wasn't possible, and they've been doing it for hundreds of millions of years too. But mathematicians, as I said, spent hundreds of years trying to prove that these structures were impossible. But in the early 19th century, after, after trying to convince themselves that they weren't possible, in the early 19th century, they finally realized, actually, again, like the aperiodic tiling, actually, mathematically, they are possible. And mathematicians at the time were so disturbed by this, because it blew their minds, that some of them, the early discoverers of this, nearly went mad. And here's a statement by one of them, one of the discoverers of these hyperbolic ge geometry structures, um, Wolfgang Boyle, and he says, for God's sake, please, for God's sake, please give it up. Fear it no less than the sensual passions, because it, too, may take up all your time, deprive you of your health, happiness, and peace of mind. Now, we don't usually think of mathematics in that kind of incredibly emotive sense. Why were mathematicians driven so bonkers by this? Why, if corals and kelps and even lettuces had been doing it for so long, why couldn't mathematicians just accept it and carry on? So I'm going to show you why it was so horrific to them. And this little anecdote about that, I think, raises the question of what does it mean to know mathematics? So as I said earlier, these hyperbolic forms are an alternative to the Euclidean geometry that you guys learn at school, that we all learn at school. At least I hope people still learn Euclidean geometry at school. And it turns out that there are, in fact, three different kinds of geometries, and you're already familiar with two of them. So the first one is Euclidean geometry, the geometry of a flat plane. The second one is the geometry of a sphere. Think what you know about the surface of the Earth if you're looking at a globe. And the third kind is called hyperbolic geometry. So there are three different kinds of geometry. And obviously, the Euclidean spherical, people have been studying them for thousands of years. But the hyperbolic one, you know, Western mathematicians only came to know about about 200 years ago. So what are these three geometries? And I want you to be, I'm going to explain it in a way first, because I, I want you to be a bit bamboozled, because you should be a bit bamboozled, because this is the, this is the way mathematical discoveries are made. Discoveries in mathematics often bamboozle the mathematicians, as we saw with that quote. These ideas are very deep ideas. They, they're not necessarily things that um, you know, should come easily to us. So one way of, of characterizing these three geometries is by looking at the curvature of them. So if you look at, the, uh, if you look at a flat piece of paper, a Euclidean surface, it's flat. It's not curved anywhere. We accept that, don't we? It just goes on forever. But if you look at a sphere, it's clearly a curved surface. And the way mathematicians characterize that is it's a positively curved, curved surface because 
if I look at a point at the center and I measure out the radius, you know, it has positive radius, say the sphere is, you know, has a radius of two feet or whatever. So it makes sense, sort of, doesn't it? If there's a positive curvature thing, could you have a negative curvature thing? And the way that you can think of that an, as an analogy is think about what you know about numbers. So you have the numbers one, two, three, four, etc. Positive numbers. And then sometime in history people said, oh, you know, we have zero number. And that was a bit controversial. It was very controversial, in fact. Finally people accepted it. And then you think, okay, well, if there's a zero and this things go this way, could things go that way? And people thought, oh, well, we could, maybe we could have numbers on that side, negative numbers. And that was very controversial, but finally they were accepted too. And so one way to think about this hyperbolic geometry is that it is a negative curvature surface. It's the geometric opposite of a sphere. So here we have, as it were, the geometric equivalence of zero, which is Euclidean, spherical, which is positive, and hyperbolic, which is negative. Now, I hope you're all feeling a bit bamboozled. So the hyperbolic surface is, as you, in a way, the geometric equivalent of the negative numbers. But what does that mean? How are we to understand that? Well, the classical way that this is done is to look at Euclid's great axiom, which hyperbolic geometry blows away. And you're going to show you that you all actually know a lot more math than you think you know, and you probably give you credit, yourself credit for. So this is Euclid's famous axiom, about, which is basically a definition of parallel lines. So effectively, this is, this is its definition of parallel line, effectively. If I have a single line and a point outside the line, we can ask the question, how many lines can I draw through the point that never meet the first line? And you all know the answer. What is it? One. Yes, someone said. Good. So that line we call the parallel line. Now, Euclid's great and controversial axiom says you can never have a situation where there's more than one line that goes through the point and never meets the other line. Sorry, you can never have more than one straight line that never that goes through the point and never meets the other line. So Euclid said they could, the answer can never be more than one. Now, it feels intuitively right to us, but mathematicians will get bothered because you know that's a pretty complicated thing to take on faith. And they always thought, if this is really true, if there can never be more than one, we should be able to prove it. And after hundreds of years, they found themselves unable to prove it. In fact, they disproved it. Now, to give you some hint about why <coughs> you, you might have some expectation that there could be another, that it might not be true, we can look at a situation where, in fact, it isn't true, which you all actually know, which is the surface of a sphere. So imagine a beach ball here, just a hollow sphere. I don't want you to think about a solid one. Just imagine a hollow beach ball, just a skin. And we can ask the same question. What if I have a straight line on the surface of my beach ball, and I put a point outside the line, and I say, how many other straight lines can I draw through my point that never meet the original one? Now we have a big problem. How are we going to define what a straight line is on a sphere, on a curved surface? Mathematicians thought about this long and hard, long time, big question, and they finally came to the idea that, well, the important concept of a straight line, of straightness, is you go from point A to point B, the shortest possible route. And so the shortest possible route on a sphere is always tracing out what's called the great circles, the biggest possible circles which are like the equator or the lines of longitude. Now, all of you actually experience the importance of this in your lives in a particular situation. Does someone want to guess what that is? Airline travel. Very good. Airline travel. So um, airlines very carefully map their routes to trace great circles on the surface of the earth because it saves them ultimately billions of dollars in jet fuel. So knowing geometry actually turns out to be, you know, very, very important as an industrial thing. So now that I have given you a big hint, I want to ask you guys to answer the question. On the surface of a sphere, if I have my straight line and my point outside the line, how many 
Other straight lines can I draw through the point that never meet the original line? So think what you know about the surface of the Earth and tell me what the answer is. Think what you know about the equator and the lines of longitude. You're all shy. I'm sure some of you know the answer or thinking the answer. Well, the answer is zero because on if you look at, if you think about the equator and the lines of longitude, they all intersect one another. So there's no such on a sphere, all straight lines intersect with one another. So on a sphere, it, there's no such thing as lines that never ever meet. So what we've shown here is that this, the geometry of a sphere is fundamentally different to the geometry of the, of the flat plane that Euclid studied. So mathematics, the mathematician would immediately say, well, you know, if there's one answer on a flat surface and there's a different answer to this question on a spherical surface, then that kind of, th they think, well, you know, could there be another kind of surface in which the answer maybe is more than one? And it turns out that indeed there is. There is another mathematical structure where the answer is more than one. And in fact, the answer is infinity. And so here we have a representation of hyperbolic, of a hyperbolic uh, plane, where we have a line and a point outside it. And I've drawn three lines that are straight lines that are parallel to that line, but don't intersect. And in fact, there are an infinite number of them. Now, I'm sure you're all sitting there and saying, you know, I'm cheating because those lines look straight, they look curved. But they only look curved. Does anyone want to hazard a guess why they look curved when I'm claiming that they're straight? Sorry? Very good. Very good. So what's happening here is the same thing as when I try to draw a map of the Earth. So if I take the Earth and I try to represent it on a flat piece of paper, which is what happens when I draw a map, I distort things. So you know, when, when we actually look at a map, a flat map, Antarctica is actually on the map a lot bigger than it is on the Earth, and so is Canada and Greenland because they're up near the poles. So this diagram, the lines will curve only because I'm trying to do a representation of it on the flat surface. But here in crochet, I can prove to you that in fact that that these lines are fact uh, these lines are in fact straight and that this situation is real mathematical possibility and therefore Euclid is wrong and the most famous proposition in mathematics is wrong. So here it turns out that you know I can in fact make models of hyperbolic geometry using crochet. And that was a discovery that was made by a mathematician at Cornell Dr. Dana Tamina, only in 1993. So 200 years after mathematicians discovered hyperbolic geometry, and all that time, for 200 years, they didn't have a way of making a model of it until Dr. Tamina came along and she said, you know what, boys, I can do this with knitting or crochet. So here we have a model of a hyperbolic surface done in crochet, and I have a representation of that diagram that I just showed you. Here it is. So here's a straight line, here's a point, and three lines that go outside it. And they look curved because, you know, this is all floppy and hanging about in my hands. But I can prove to you that it's actually in the surface itself, they are straight. Because if I take any one of these lines and I fold along it, it's straight. And that's actually a physical proof that this is straight and the Euclid parallel postulate, as I said, the most famous postulate in mathematics, is wrong. So what is the, bri the brilliance of Dr. Dan Tamina's models is she didn't actually introduce new mathematics. What she demonstrated was that you could actually model this in a physical, tangible way using a beautiful, simple handicraft, crochet, or knitting. And you can, in fact, do them in any candy craft. You can do them with knitting, crochet, beading, tanning if you wanted to, 
but crochet is the easiest one. You could also build beautiful paper models of this. And we had a workshop the other day um, in Andy Wilkinson's class where we made these, we made models of this using paper. So using physical methodology, embodied acts, you can actually genuinely explore this mathematics. And this is mathematics, this college level mathematics. I learned this at university just through the equations. And I can tell you it was really bamboozling. Just to, physic, to see this in a material thing is so empowering. And you can stitch all sorts of theorems onto these and demonstrate things that are, that are really bamboozling to understand without it. So for instance, here's a simple thing. On a flat plane, we all learn in school that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Well, that's true on a Euclidean plane, but it's not true on a sphere, it's not true on a hyperbolic surface. On the, on a sphere, angles by triangle always add up to more than 180, and on a hyperbolic surface, they always add up to less than 180. And in fact, when you get a very big triangle on a hyperbolic surface, the angle, the interior angles actually add up to zero degrees. And you can stitch that onto a larger version of this and, and show it physically, and it's just wonderful that, that these materially embodied things can give us access to these deep abstract ideas. Now, when the mathematicians discovered hyperbolic geometry, it opened their minds to a wonderful question, which is this. If mathematics gives us different geometric possibilities for what could be mathematically, what's logically consistent, three different possibilities, flat, spherical, hyperbolic, what is the space of the universe, the out, you know, does the space of the world, the universe, outer space, does it have a mathematical structure? And before the discovery of hyperbolic geometry, from new, really from Newton on, people had just assumed that the space of our universe was Euclidean, that it was basically like a three-dimensional version, you know, length, breadth forward, back, up, down, and that it was just this straight, rectilinear thing. But it turns out that there is some evidence that we might just live in a hyperbolic universe. Most of the cosmological evidence is that we actually, that it probably will be Euclidean on a big, on the big scale. But that's one of the reasons that we're sending all these expensive telescopes into space, is to answer this question, what is the geometry of the cosmos itself? And I should add here, this is, this is something we, we can figure out through the mathematics of general relativity because underlying general relativity is the general geometry of curved surfaces which was introduced by the discovery of the hyperbolic one. So hyperbolic geometry ultimately revolutionized mathematics and led to a whole enlargement of, of geometry which led to a generalized geometry which Einstein used in his theory of general relativity. And if we plug in the, you know, the, the correct measurements from outer space, we should ultimately be able to plug them into those equations of general relativity and figure out the geometry of the universe. Now, it will be that our universe is not a two-dimensional structure, obviously. It's not, it, it's four-dimensional. It has the three dimensions of space like we have sitting in this room and the added dimension of time. So the equation of general relativity look at geometry in four dimensions, but we are pretty certain that probably on the big scale, our geometry in 4D is, is, is Euclidean. But as I said, there's some nice evidence it could be hyperbolic. Now, here's something that's really interesting. These flowers, these calories, they are also hyperbolic surfaces. And there's a team of mathematicians, or there used to be a team, sorry, physicists, there used to be a team of physicists at the University of Texas, I think they were in Austin, who were trying to understand how flowers could make hyperbolic structures. And the mathematicians found, sorry, the physicists and mathematicians working with them found that when they did models of these um, structures, these hyperbolic structures that the flowers were making, that they actually had to model them in four dimensions. So in order to get the models right, they had to do it in four dimensions. And so that really raises again this question that I'd like to come back to, which is, does the flower understand four dimensions? 
somehow the flower is incarnating, is embodying a structure that at least when we do the mathematical modeling of it, we have to go to four dimensions. So again, I'd like to raise the question, does the flower, as it were, know the mathematics? In some sense, it's incarnating it. So um, I'm just going to skip over that bit because we oh, well, actually, no, I'll do it very quickly. Um, one way of understanding um, these hyperbolic surfaces is, is through a link to what we learned about earlier, or what we were discussing earlier, um, how you can fill a plane with tiles. And the most canonical way that you can fill a plane with tiles is what we all see in the bathroom floors, is hexagons. But if I want to do something similar to that to model the other two geometries, spherical and hyperbolic, I can't do it with hexagons. I have to do something slightly different. So if I want to model a sphere, what I do is I take away some of the hexagons and I replace them with five-sided heptagons. So I've literally taken away a little bit of the, I've taken away some sides, taken away some space, and therefore pulled it in and pulled the surface from being sort of open to being closed. And if I want to do it to make a hyperbolic one, what I do is I make the opposite move. Instead of taking away some sides and replacing hexagons with five-sided ones, I replace the hexagons with seven-sided ones, and that gives me more space. And that's the structures that we built in this workshop at Andy's class yesterday. And here's a beautiful example of a really big one. Now, here is a really interesting question. So we can make these models, you know, I can draw these things and we can model, make them with paper shapes, hexagons, Euclidean, um, hexagons and heptagons, I mean, and pentagons and soccer ball, which is an approximation of a sphere, hexagons and heptagons, which is approximation of a hyperbolic surface. So here's a really nice question. That's a sort of mathematical model, but is there any, I set out a few years ago to ask the question, is there anything in nature that actually makes all these structures? And it turns out that there is. So at the atomic level, carbon actually makes all of these structures. So carbon assembles itself into sheets of graphite, which are sheets, graphite is what we use in pencils, the sheets have the carbon atoms arranged in a series of hexagons. And we can roll those sheets up and create tubes, which are now, these tubes of what's called in, um, what is, they're called graphene, um, are turning out to be super materials that may help us, you know, have a new generation of, for, for instance, of electronics. And they, they're being used in all sorts of things. It also turns out that we have math, uh, sorry, chemists found out about 20, in the 1990s, about almost 30 years ago now, that carbon could also assemble itself into um, soccer ball shapes, called, and that whole kind of chemistry of these soccer ball shaped carbon molecules, they named them after Buckminster Fuller, who you know, invented the geodesic dome, and they're called fullerenes, or Buckminster fullerenes. And these two are turning out to be profoundly useful chemicals that are being used in all sorts of places, and again, have unbelievable properties that, again, may be used in all sorts of futuristic super materials. But here's the thing that amazed me. I didn't know, and I'd never heard anyone say this until I set out to look a couple of, you know, a year or so ago. Is it possible that carbon or anything in the, at the atomic level has also made hyperbolic structures, you know, the network of the, he the hexagons and heptagons? And it turns out that about five years ago, some scientists in Canberra discovered that actually carbon does make hyperbolic structures at the atomic level, and they, they call it carbon nanofoam. It's such a new material, nobody knows what we're going to do with it. But isn't that amazing? that you know, mathematicians discover these things and then it turns out that nature can do it and these things are probably happening around stars. 
you know, we can make them in silk very. So isn't that amazing? Now, as I said earlier, these hyperbolic structures, for us humans, they're hard to make. Even though lettuces and corals have been doing it for hundreds of millions of years, it's actually very difficult for humans to make models of this. But you can do it with crochet, and that's what Dr. Dana Tamina discovered. But as I said earlier, nothing in nature is perfect. There's no such thing as a mathematically perfect sphere in nature. There's no such thing as a mathematically perfect hyperbolic structure in nature. So a couple, about 12 years ago, my sister and I started playing around with this hyperbolic crochet. And we got sick of doing the mathematically perfect ones. And we thought, what if we go a bit wonky? What if we just you know, don't stick to Dr. Tamina's exact crochet formula, but we deviate and we go wonky? And what we discovered was that they started to look natural. And we put a little pile of them together, and they started to look like a real coral reef, because this is what coral reefs are actually doing. Corals are making these hyperbolic structures, but never exactly, never perfectly. So if you want to make them look natural, you have to deviate from the pure mathematics, and as it were, go a little bit bananas. And over the last 12 years, we have invited lots of other people to join us in making crochet coral reefs, and people have come up with lovely innovations of their own. So some people you know, added fluffy things, some people have done it in beading, we've done it in plastic. And what's been so lovely is that effectively a kind of crochet tree of life has emerged with all this different taxonomy of crochet coral beings each one a bit different from the other. And this is really like a recapitulation of life on Earth. You know, life on Earth starts from very simple seeds, you know, very simple cells, and you wait ten, you know, four billion years and then you get giraffes and peacocks. And so too, this project has given rise to a whole taxonomy of crochet coral critters. And it should be said that just as there is a DNA code underlying every living organism, so there's a code underlying all of these crochet organisms. And I could literally write out the code if I wanted to. I could formalize it just like I could write down the DNA code. I can sequence, you know, a peacock or a giraffe. I could write down the code of all of these critters. But actually, it's much more interesting to just play with them. You know, I mean, I could get someone to write out all the codes. I could do it, but that would be boring. But I can just get to work doing them and exploring. And over the last 12 years, my sister and I have worked with people all over the world, and we have created this huge taxonomy of crochet coral reefs. And we've worked with people in 40 different cities and countries all over America, Australia, Europe, the United Arab, Arab, Arab Emirates, Germany, Latvia, etc., etc. And to date, there have been over 40 of these reefs made and about 10,000 people, almost all of them women, have participated in making these, and they've all learned about hyperbolic geometry, and they've all done hyperbolic geometry by crocheting them. And the exhibitions have been shown, sometimes when we, when we do them with the people, up to 1,000 people get involved in making one of these crochet reefs. And we've shown them in museums and galleries, including very, very elite museums and galleries like the Smithsonian, the Hayward Gallery in London, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. And each time each community makes them, it's unique and different. Just as each individual coral is unique and different, so each coral reef is unique and different. And I want to end by just showing you a few of the most recent pictures of some of our um, you know, most recent exhibitions. And to give you a sense of scale, they're about 10 feet high and each one of those involves many, many hundreds of crochet pieces and thousands of hours of human labor. And what I want to put it to you is that this project is an art project. It's also calling attention to coral reefs and the plight of the fact that reefs are being devastated and wiped out by global warming. And that was one of our big motivations to do it, to call attention to the plight of global warming that is devastating reefs, and particularly the Great Barrier Reefs in our hometown of Australia. But on top of that, what I want to propose is that this project is a project in applied mathematics. 
The project engages all of its participants in actually doing mathematics. They're not going to be able to go and sit a Cornell University mathematics exam at the end of it. But during the workshops, when we talk about the hyperbolic geometry, as I've been talking about it with you, we end up discussing the foundations of geometry and the fact that it underlies general relativity. We end up having very sophisticated discussions about the curvature of space-time. And what I want to say is that things doing mathematics include people doing mathematics and that mathematics can be engaged with by people, by all people, through processes of materially embodied performing it. So thank you very much. <laughs>